Good day, everyone. Welcome to this second in the 2017 series from the Georgia Independent School Association and Firestorm. We're going to be focusing today on behavioral risk threat assessment. How do you stop bullying, suicide, and guns before it's too late? Waiting until that gun comes to school is certainly not something that we want to see and do. And we're going to give you some inside thoughts about something that you can do within your school this year to make a difference. So as we uh, start our webinar today, I would like to remind you to be our, our friend on uh, Twitter at Firestorm Soul, or go on Facebook at Firestorm Solutions. The hashtag for this session is hashtag Crisis Coach. When you think about Firestorm, we transform crisis into values. We empower you to manage risk and crises, and our expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. Down on the bottom right-hand side, you'll see that term crisis coach. Firestorm is America's crisis coach, and that's part of what we're doing in this crisis coach webinar series to share with you some insights. It's trying to balance the difference between risk and crisis. Now, our attorneys make us do a disclaimer. You've got a lot of attorneys. And the, the presentation isn't complete without the oral comments and discussion. Any work problem for us must be interpreted with guidance from the authorities as well as your organization's personal legal counsel. And finally, that the information we're giving should not be interpreted as legal advice or legal opinion. So as we think about today, this webinar series is underwritten by the Georgia Independent School Association. And uh, the association is very valuable and provides great benefit uh, to the members. Uh, you can go to firestorm.com and watch past webinars. You can go there and download the briefs and papers. And you can contact us if you need assistance uh, via the website. Uh, you can register for the future webinars that we are, in fact, doing. Uh, Jeff couldn't be with us today. Jeff is normally on uh, most of our uh, webinars uh, as president of the association. And I believe there's an upcoming meeting here uh, next month that will give you a good opportunity for your heads of school and your leadership to learn more about what's coming up. And it's down in Callaway Gardens. Uh, by the way, we're talking to you today from Roswell, just outside Atlanta, and looking at the uh, weather map. We're glad we're not in New Jersey, New York or Connecticut with 12 inches of snow. So we've had a mild winter in Georgia, and I know that's probably been a benefit to you within your schools. Uh, I'm Jim Satterfield. I'm the president and uh, CEO of Firestorm, and look forward to uh, talking with you today on this subject. So as we start about, and we think about the word crisis, and that big red word that's appearing there, I would like you to think about what comes to mind. And, you see a lot of things there up at the top of the screen that would relate to some physical events, a, a tornado, a hurricane, uh, those things. You see some of the violence elements there with that explosion in the building. But when we think about schools, I think the worst fear is the concept of an active shooter. When we hear the stories, uh, and as you all know, Firestorm did the crisis management coming up 10 years ago at Virginia Tech. Uh, after that uh, episode of workplace violence in the school. And Dr. Steger had to pick up that phone and make 32 phone calls to families to say, your loved one's not coming home today. So a crisis becomes this turning point and the trend of all future events. If I were to say the name Columbine to you, you would think immediately not of the state flower in the state of Colorado, but of the shootings that occurred at that school. So being careful in these areas, it becomes something that could ultimately define you and your school and your students and teachers for a long and excessive period. So that future events will follow up as a result of the actions that you take. Waiting for the gun to come to school is too late. Identifying that exposure in advance. So let's look at a bunch of schools. So you see them all depicted here on this slide. Uh, and you can probably pick out your school. Now, which one of those dots is it? But if suddenly something occurs, there's, that's going to stand out. That, the parents are immediately going to become concerned. The media will be identifying it. 
And so your plans, your preparation, and your ability to identify the behaviors of concern before they escalate to violence allows you to blend back in with everyone else. Because we don't want to let these events define who you are within your school. So if something were, were to occur, now you've got emergency response plans. There are actions that you can take, but they're going to be extremely limited when, because we're now dealing with violence occurring physically in the school. If we can intervene before we get to that point, there's going to be a significant difference. Now, because if we don't, it's going to escalate and it's going to cover everything associated with your school and define who you are, who your students are, and what's going to happen. And in a worst case scenario, put you in a position of having to make that call to explain that someone's not coming home from school today. So where do you start? First, you've got to recognize that a crisis is not business as usual, it's business as unusual. Almost everything you learn initially in a crisis is wrong, and so you're going to be forced to make decisions based upon wrong information and information that's inadequate to understand all of the elements. So we look at the lessons that we've learned from being on the ground at these types of institutions coming in after the fact and identifying what needs to take place. And over the last five years, after extensive research, we've been able to develop a program that helps you to identify these behaviors of concern and make it available within your school so that you can intervene at the earliest possible point to stop that path to violence. So let's, where do we start? Well, threatening behavior is pretty clear. If you see there's bullying going on or cyberbullying, if there's fights, if there's stalking, if we think about uh, violence or threats that are made, uh, weapons at school uh, could certainly be a factor. I think we all can identify those types of things very quickly and say, whoa, we better do something now. We don't have an opportunity to wait. But some of those behaviors aren't as clear. You see some lists of things there, uh, uh, takes criticism poorly, there's some odd behavior, maybe we're having attendance problems, uh, some type of a loner uh, personality. Those are the things that aren't, aren't so clear. So it has to be a formal structure of how how do we gather this information? How do we understand that information? How do we categorize it? How do we screen it? What do we need to do? I would draw your attention to the word in red, change, in the uh, right-hand column. That's one of the key indicators to look at. When you've got the student that was doing uh, well in school with good grades and suddenly starts doing poorly, the student who starts having attendance problems, or having attention problems in class or starts to act out. That change, that delta, is one of the key things that we look for as we consider behavior and see this passive escalation. And I want to emphasize that we're looking at behavior and not demographics. This is a, a behavioral-based system that you need to understand. Now, the good news down in the blue box there is that there are some protective factors. Um, someone that is, uh, has the activities and the attachments, um, the coping skills that are there, those can mitigate it. We're going to take these threats and we're going to take these behaviors of concern and look at them in two or three different ways to help you understand what we're talking about to establish a foundation based upon awareness within your school. So first, let's talk about specifically what leads to violence. And, You'll see three big uh, circles up on the screen. One talks about a breakdown of support systems. Another talks about personal factors. And another one talks about workplace or school factors, things that could happen within your area. And you see the breakdown that would start to happen in family and marriage and home and how those elements impact our students or our, our staff at school. Uh, substance abuse, aggressive histories, we see those patterns repeated, uh, perceptions of injustice, job insecurity, conflict uh, with others. So those are things that are clearly on a path to make a difference. Who might pose this high threat? And you now see them kind of organized together. And you've probably seen some of these happening with someone associated with your school. We had a webinar that was played. Uh, we worked with insurance carriers. and they. Uh, did a recorded series for their insurers 
Uh, and they have about 150,000 of them. And one of them was watching the webinar, and they looked at this list, and they immediately identified a person within their church that had every single one of these. And so they were concerned and called, and we started to work with them to find a way to see if they can get a handle on this and to identify what actions they need to take. One of the things that I've found that helps generally when you look at these types of descriptors are there faces that you can put on them in your previous experience in your current school or earlier schools or where you went to school because it may say, you know, I remember this person and they kind of had that and that gives you a base point or a reference to make those decisions. So let's go again to some of those that are clear and we talk about warning signs. Any uh, mention of suicide, it's not a joke. We have to take it seriously. And there's a secondary risk here that I want to make sure that you're aware of. We have virtually 100% correlation in a school environment that a student who is contemplating suicide has a kill list. Here are the people that I want to get even with before I take my own life. And that presents uh, a great exposure as well as you can imagine the communications needs that you have to have to go to those parents and talk and tell them that their child was in fact on a list. So suicide is something that we don't have any choice with. Intimidating comments. If someone's saying, I'm going to uh, attack them, I'm going to shoot them, I'm going to kill them, we have to immediately intervene. And fits of rage. We're seeing the emotional swing greatly in our um, students where there are some that just, there's a breaking point in which that continues. And destruction of property. We worked with a, a, a school where there was a student who became violent and was pushing his, punching his hand through the, the sheetrock on the wall. And so those are things that are all clear flags and red flags to look at. Let's think, let's go back a step and talk about some that aren't quite so clear. Fascinations with the weapons. Well, in the South, hunting is a normal uh, family event. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about focusing on it greatly. Uh, where that becomes the dri driving force. You'll see postings on Facebook and other sites, uh, fascination with criminals. Every year on the anniversary of major events, we see copycats in other schools or someone who wants to best what happened at Columbine or uh, Virginia Tech. So those are elements and dates that we can be looking for and that behavior we need to look at. Depression. Uh, depression is a precursor here. We've got a student who's uh, depressed and has an image issue or is looking at cutting. Those are the types of things that we want to intervene with earlier in the process. Substance abuse, drugs and alcohol, um, those are changes in behavior that we need to intervene and take a look at. Suspected abuse at home, domestic violence has come to school. Domestic violence affects students in a variety of ways. Also, teachers. Uh, the number one, number two cause of death of women in the workplace, and school is a workplace, is uh, workplace violence. That domestic violence coming to work. The spouse knows when the teacher starts, when the teacher leaves to go home, so you've got a clear target in a location. And then any major change in behavior. Someone that was active in the van and drops out. Someone that's not involved in sports or not dealing with their friends as they've dealt in the past. All of these become warning signs. Now the protective signs and factors that we looked at, you're seeing coming up on your screen again. And So these are someone who has a strong community. Maybe they have interest and involvement in church or other activities outside of school. They respect authority. They can cope. They take responsibilities. It's the isolated person that makes a difference. So we've started now with talking about awareness. Now you've got to have a way of, now that we're aware, what do we do? How do we know this? What are the next steps associated with it? And that's where you put it into a framework. And that's behavioral risk threat assessment. That program, by the way, the acronym is BERTA, B-E-R-T-H-A, is a way to look at 
of how we deal with someone that's in a path to violence and intercede earlier. All the conversation in the webinar to this point has been focused on the awareness training. You've got to train people what to look for, and that's the beginning foundation. Because if we intervene when the first signs are there, and it doesn't get to the point that the only choice that the student or the teacher feels is bringing that gun to school. Now, when that happens, we have to have an intelligence network. We have to become informed with that. Uh, anonymous reporting, and you need a system to do that, and that could be an email or a web application. It could be a, a telephone line where they can leave a voicemail message. We're also seeing that having anonymous text reporting is a key differentiator. Uh, our young people will go out to dinner and use their phone and type with their thumbs uh, to pass the salt. And if you've got the ability to send an anonymous text, you'll gain more information about what's going on in your school, and that's a program that we're seeing uh, implemented. And the good news is it's not very expensive. The great news is even if you see something occurring, you can do that text without being clearly identified as the person who did it, and your level of intervention increases. Monitoring of social media. Uh, social media is not random. It's targeted. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But there's some statistics here that help us greatly. If someone has ill intent, 80% of the time somebody else knows, and 67% of the time two or more people know. And when people know, what do they do? They talk. And where do they talk? They talk on social media. Um, Karen Mazzullo is our chief information uh, officer, chief technology officer at Firestorm. And she saw a picture of a student in a class with a gun, and it bothered her. She started doing a research around that and found that it was a school in uh, South Carolina, contacted the principal because she had learned it was a math class and was able to put that together and said, I don't know if this is a current picture or an old picture or a fake gun or a real, but I felt like I needed you to know. And the principal thanked her and checked in the class, and sure enough, there was a student in a class with a gun and was able to handle the situation before it turned to physical violence. And he called her back and said, I appreciate this. It made a great difference for us. The thing that concerns me is that I had 30 students who knew about it, who made posting, and not one came forward to tell someone on our staff or a teacher. So you have to have an intelligence system, and we'll talk about that more. If we also look at standard reporting methods, how does that information flow in? Pre-screening and background checks, as you all know, annual background checks are mandatory or and best practices in the education marketplace. And those are not only federal databases of felonies, you need to look at the courthouse level and to identify misdemeanors. Would you want to know that you had a volunteer or a teacher who had a substance abuse problem or who had been involved in domestic violence? They may have been fine when you hired them three years ago, but what's occurring now? And then finally, key metrics. Has there been a change in attendance or in performance by the student? Um, those metrics could well be the indicator. So we start out with awareness, then we have to have an intelligence network to gather that information. The next step is you've got to have a place to put that information, a central repository. So all of that information comes together. This teacher sees something, a coach sees something, another stu student sees something. How do you link all three of those things together to know that we have a student that's on the path to violence? And then ultimately could be escalated to be your behavioral management team within the school to categorize that behavior and ultimately to do a risk assessment around it. So where, where do we go from here? And that's in creating a plan, a behavioral risk threat assessment program, where the tips would come in, they get an initial risk categorization, your behavioral management team then would go through a screening process, and then you can develop an action plan. What are we going to do with this student? How do we monitor for that? And then sign off and record key. Now, when we talk about a behavioral management team, and we'll mention this a couple of times, we recommend that that be a team with a minimum of three people. Uh, someone representing the counseling side or the human resource 
outside within the school. Someone representing the security or safety or facility uh, aspects of your school. And finally, someone representing the academics side of your school. We want three people involved in going through the process and rendering that decision. If it boils down to a single person, they can be right or wrong, and it's easy to be misled. We find that the team of three will make a significant difference. So let's go back to the warning signs one more time and try to frame those in a little different way. Think about creating a behavioral snapshot. And we're not limiting ourselves to a single point in time because, in fact, what you will learn is we want to look at behavior over a time. It's like a, watching a video or a movie. But in those puzzle piece parts there in the center of the circle, that categorizes each of these to give you the ability to look at it. How do I segment this? How do I start to analyze it and render it? In the behavioral risk threat assessment program, there are interview guides, there are tools, there are steps that you take to go through this categorization and then ultimately the screening so that you have an accurate assessment of what the risk is associated with that. So let's look at that school category first uh, where it says social and peer. We think about here that someone who holds a grudge, that there's an odd erratic behavior, name calling, abusive language. Those are all social and peer related areas uh, to focus on. We can think about the family. Is it domestic abuse there? If we find abuse in the home, that abuse is going to come to work. And it's an opportunity for you to identify those. Multiple losses. It could be a divorce. It could be a separation. A, a death of a parent or a sibling uh, makes a difference in the life of that student. Next, in, uh, the physiological. And you see a lot of descriptors here. Uh, mood disorders, power of under or over control anger. The person who is just not emotive that could well be that. Shame and rejection associated. The urgency. Uh, these are events that we're not going to wait for, that we're going to immediately involve uh, our security and the police. We're going to have an immediate intervention if we see these types of behaviors that are coming. And then specifically looking at other behaviors that are the early indicators. Uh, someone that has a, a history in this area, so substance abuse, poor relationships at school, those elements would come into play. Now we balance all of those behaviors by looking at the protective factors, the family, the friends, the support system that's in place. Those can start to mitigate each of those elements. Now we've given you, I think, a good overview of the awareness and the behaviors of concern. Let's and we describe the structure. Let me give it to you graphically in a little different format. Notice at the left of your screen, there's all the awareness by right? our students and our teachers and our staff. Then the intelligence network, that's how that information flows over with the anonymous reporting, the monitoring that we're doing on social media. Um, sometimes there's a, an answering machine or even a service that could be involved uh, to handle that the screening and background checks, and the key metrics. If we're seeing changes in performance, that's one of our key intelligence indicators that someone's on a path to violence. Now, if you look at the birth of plan area, the first is how do we take that tip in? How do we uh, categorize that risk? And I'm going to break that into three parts for you on the next slide. With the central repository and the anal analysis of that information, your behavioral management team within the school, or how do you conduct an investigation, how do you do the risk screening, then the action plan, what are we going to do with this student or this teacher, uh, how is the case management working, and then finally the sign off and central repository. There are other factors there in the green uh, that you see that you'll want to make sure that's in place because this doesn't eliminate the need for security and access and emergency plans within your school. But let's really go now. There's some tip. There's some information that's occurred. You've observed some behavior that gives you pause. What's the first thing that happens? Now, in a school environment, we recommend that you have an administrator on duty. That's uh, someone assigned to take that call. If uh, someone observes something, that you become aware of a problem. And it's their job to do the initial categorization 
And we focus on three buckets here. Bucket number one is it's routine. It's a normal discipline problem. We're going to handle that as we would any. It could be detention. It could be whatever the system is within your school. That's a routine. And schools do an excellent job with those types of normal behavior things. Now let's jump all the way to the right. It's an urgent action. Somebody shows up with a gun in their backpack, you're calling the police. You're implementing your plan for that because there is an urgent action that needs to take place. Life safety concerns become paramount, and you're going to remove the threat from the school at that point. Where all schools have difficulty is that middle categorization, and that action is investigate. You know, it's more than a normal. Uh, our normal routine discipline issues. It's not yet up to that imminent violent action that's going to take place. What do we do? And so the person who gets that conducts a preliminary review and then does a characterization to determine what's going to happen next. And then it would be escalated and where you see TMA, uh, that could be a threat management team or in schools we generally recommend it being called a behavioral management team to take those actions and to fill in. And regardless of which one of these three buckets, all of that information goes into a central repository. Because if you saw something now that was in that routine category, and next week there's something else, and the week after that something, uh, something else happens, pulling those together might change how you view this. If you lose that view from a central repository, you're going to miss something in seeing the friend land develop. Now let's, let's hit what happens. The uh, administrator on duty has now said, you know, we need to investigate that. Well, the behavioral management team or the threat management team kicks in at this point in time. They go through the interviews. There are uh, assessments that can be conducted to render an opinion. There's a step-by-step -step way that asks questions that you can document and evaluate so that this team can render an opinion that this person is on a path of violence and something needs to happen. That's where this screening comes in play. Now, God has We can, we're going to continue to monitor there, not as full, but there's going to be time to see what's going to happen. Now we've been doing our investigation. Let's go all the way to the right. It's imminent. This person is about to explode. We need to take action now. We don't have the luxury of waiting. And so with the same actions we would have taken on the other, we're calling 911, we're going to remove that threat from school. Severe is not that imminent where it's going to happen. But we think there's a potential that it could escalate quickly into violence. At this point, we're going to suspend the student. We're going to tell the parents that the student can't return back to school unless we have a, a letter from a psychiatrist or a forensic psychologist that the student is no longer a risk to themselves or others. When they come back to the school, we would have a re-entry plan associated with it and a detailed plan of what we're going to do when they come back to school so that we can monitor uh, that process. Now, the elevated risk is in between that severe and guarded. There's enough here that we're really concerned about this student. We're not yet ready to stay. We need to suspend them or remove them from the school. So we'll have a detailed program put into place of what we're expecting from them. We're going to have specific follow-up. We're going to involve the teachers and the coaches. And we're going to work and have a specific program to deal with that student. Again, all of that information comes back. It goes into the central repository, and we carry through with those plans. The key here is identifying this behavior before it escalates to that violence level in those directions. So the Behavioral Risk Threat Assessment Program boils down to the words that you see on the screen. Awareness, reporting, central repository, and the plan. Investigate, screening, action plan for the subject. Sometimes we call that case management, monitoring, and assign help and record keeping. A minimum of three people on your behavioral management team. And the Bertha program that we're doing in conjunction with the Georgia Independent School Association 
is available to you as a license, and the first year is at no cost to the school, and it includes the training. We're rolling this out now, and it would be a program that I would like to see you take advantage of, put it in place now as we do the spring session and leading into summer. So when it's back to school in the fall, you have everything in place and putting that program together. So I talked a lot about uh, can you predict crises, and the answer to that is unequivocally yes. If you look at the warning signs, these indicators, and intervening before they escalate the violence becomes absolutely critical. And this predictive intelligence, the term of art here is called open source intelligence, is something that should be available to your school. Uh, the good news is that monitoring of social media, having all of these elements in place is inexpensive and gives you a great insight, just like the school that Karen identified in South Carolina for the student with the gun. So what if we do is you can identify the target, because social media isn't random, it's targeted. We see many things around cyberbullying where someone's being picked up on over the internet and this person is becoming the target associated with it. That gives us a point of intervention. By the way, in many of these cases, it's not the bully that we're concerned about. It's the person who was targeted, who was bullied, and ultimately later feels they have no option but to attack that. Um, but today we're in an environment, as we gave in statistics earlier, when people know they talk, and they talk on social media. Words and intent matter, and that's the differential that we're looking for. By the way, this is an area where English teachers certainly have a big advantage in those English majors looking at semantics of speech, syntax, context, uh, and idiom to determine is this escalating or is it stable. So we look at these complex uh, patterns there. We listen to what's being said, where they're being said, and as they occur. Now, we're not hacking into somebody's personal account. These are things that are out in the public area to be seen. The second portion of that is looking, where we go look at a person or a location or an event, and it gives us a clearer insight, and we have the ability to even go back in time to see what were they saying last Thursday to measure that trend line. We need to understand these behaviors of concern, and then we add our experience to create predictable intelligence that this person's on a path uh, to violence. So I, list, I showed here listening and looking. Listening is where we're looking at streams and phrases and words. It's a general listening background. Think about it like a tripwire. We see that. We're going to now intervene and take an action. When we see that particular individual, we can look at what's their sphere of influence. Who are they talking with? Uh, what did they say previously? Or we can look at a location. Uh, or we can look at a particular event and start to put that together. We've okay, had success in finding those individuals through that particular process. So what are our recommendations? You need a plan. And this is more than having a plan of what are we going to do when the guy's standing in the hall with the gun. We want to be able to say, what do we do to identify these behaviors of concern and intervene before they clearly are there? Understanding the warning signs, getting people aware of those, getting them involved. And this is students, it's teachers, it's parents. Coming together with a way to get those anonymous reports in and then having a way to act on them. Support resources locally. You might want to have access to a forensic psychologist that can help you if you're trying to interpret your behaviors. Uh, Firestorm can provide virtual assistance to your behavioral management team if you're in doubt in that process. The Bertha process gives you checklists, forms, and procedures to move you systematically through so that you make sure you've considered everything. By the way, there is insurance now in this area, and that's something you might want to look at and go to your insurance broker and say, are we covered for uh, uh, an active shooter or deadly weapon? How is our insurance uh, come into play? And one of the things generally across all the areas of concern within the school, you want to make sure your insurance broker is saying yes, you're adequately covered. You must have an open source intelligence network. This is something that wasn't available to us 10 years ago. It's available now, and that can make a tremendous difference. 
you need to train your staff, train your students, train your parents, and then test your plans and make sure that they work. So what do you need to do? I would recommend that you update your risk and threat assessment for your school. That's since more physical security. Once three, every three years, you need to go back and look at those areas and specifically focus on access. Make sure your crisis management plan is currently aligned to standards and best practices about how do you make decisions when you have long information. Develop a behavioral risk threat assessment program. Unfortunately, because of your membership in GISA, you have access to this for the first year at no cost. Finalize a crisis communications plan with your message counts. What are you going to say if these things occur? Contact us if you plant yourself uh, in crisis. We have a program called Crisis Stop that we do for uh, the Georgia Independent School Association member schools. That they find themselves in a crisis, they can pick up the phone and call Firestorm 24-7 and we'll provide them assistance. There is no charge for that first hour. And in Slatter Stop, they stand for stabilize uh, the situation that you're in, trigger whatever responses that you need, help you opine on what the consequences of this will be, both in the short and the long term, and then finally prevent uh, you from making the common mistakes that others do. I would really encourage you to do an analysis of your insurance and your current response plan, and then stress test your plan. Last week we did a virtual exercise. We had several hundred uh, schools and organizations on, and we went through a live streaming video of sexting and cyberbullying. These are things to be thinking about now, not when they actually happen. So there is a brief from today's uh, webinar. Uh, in the next couple of days, you'll be able to go on the Firestorm site at firestorm.com slash briefs. You'll see there that you could get re download a recording of this webinar. You can get a brief. You can share the recordings with others in your school. You can share the brief. You'll see copies of many of the slides that were shown here included in it. And it's a tool that you can use. Over the last five years, we've built a strong video library for the Georgia Independent Association of Schools on a variety of topics. This is one. This is a great emerging threat. And unfortunately, it's every parent's worst nightmare. That call from uh, the school to say, your child isn't coming home today. Our thanks go out again to the Georgia uh, Independent Schools Association and everything that they're doing to make a difference in each of your schools each year in the support that's coming up. I'll remind you again of the meeting coming up at Callaway Gardens, another opportunity to interface with peer schools. If you uh, want more information, you can go to firestorm.com uh, and view past webinars. You can download the briefs. If you've got a specific question, send us an email at webinars at firestorm.com and we'll reach back to you or call us 800-321-2219. We're here to help and support your school. We're committed to helping uh, educational institutions across the country. We're available to you 24 by 7 if you find yourself in a crisis. But our goal is to prepare you to be in a position not to have a crisis, that you've got trained staff, you've recognized the behaviors, that you were intervening earlier. My prayer is that none of you will have to pick up the phone and call a family and say, your son or your daughter aren't coming home today. Having lived through that at Virginia Tech and other schools and events, we know the trauma that that means to an organization. We want you to avoid that. There is, again, an opportunity for you immediately to intervene to add in a program of behavioral risk threat assessment within your school at no cost so that you have a systematic way to deal with those exposures and to, to intervene early. Thank you for your time today. There will be another webinar next month. Uh, we've enjoyed our relationship. Hopefully this has been of help. If you've got a question, give us a call. We're going to try to reach out to everyone who's on today's webinar to answer your questions directly. Thanks all. Have a great day. Goodbye.